Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And feel free to keep your hymnals open to hymn number 437 uh, throughout the sermon as we'll kind of be going verse by verse. Easter is in 11 days. And allegedly, we are officially now in the season of springtime. Um, I'm not sure that I buy it. Um, But hopefully soon, the distant memory of warm weather will once again be a reality for us. Many of us are looking forward to that, right? To the warm weather, the sunny days, of which, well, we don't get too many in Cleveland, but when when we get them, they're great. But we're looking forward to spring break coming up. Maybe we've got some vacations lined up over spring break, and we just, you know, marking the days off, counting down. Maybe we can even see summer on the horizon, and summer vacations, and maybe those of us who don't, we don't have to go to school for a while. Students are, and teachers are both excited about that. But even with all these wonderful things on the horizon, we're still in the season of Lent right now. And so as we look here in the sanctuary, the cross still dominates the scenery here. And we can look at the cross uh, from many different angles. We can look at the cross and we can see a symbol of victory for us. The victory that our Lord Jesus has won for us by dying in our place and forgiving our sins. So we can look at it and see the great victory of God that he has shared with us. We can also look at it and we can see love, the outrageous love that Jesus showed as he willingly went to the cross and died for us. We can also look at the cross and see peace, the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that Christ has won for us by putting us back into right relationship with God by forgiving our sins. But there's another major aspect of the cross. And I'm going to say that we can also look at the cross and we can see that it was a horrible necessity. The cross was a horrible necessity. Because the cross points out the big problem that each one of us has. Big problem called sin. The big problem that God Himself had to come down from heaven to take care of personally for us. Now, again, we're in the season of Lent. Sometimes we call that a penitential season. And I love to use fancy words like that. Basically, that means it's a season in which we focus on our sins and we feel sorry for them. We recognize our own sinfulness and why Jesus had to go to the cross. So often, though, because we see Easter on the horizon, we tend to, even during the season of Lent, kind of gloss over our sins. And I don't think we reflect upon our sinfulness maybe as much as we ought to. We don't reflect upon our need for a Savior. Don't reflect upon our need for a Savior who bled and suffered and died on the cross. Well, tonight as we take a look at this uh, very kind of melancholy but beautiful hymn, Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed, can we do something? This is going to sound a little weird, a little weird maybe, but can we take this opportunity to feel bad about ourselves for a little while tonight? Can we take this opportunity to kind of maybe go to a dark place for a little bit? Let's put on more of a somber, kind of a sorrowful mood and reflect on how our Savior did bleed and suffer terrible things because of the huge mess that human beings like you and I made of things. So again, feel free as we go through the hymn here to follow along verse by verse. That first word of verse 1, alas, This is not a word that I tend to use in casual conversation. Alas, I had had to look it up. And, um, but remember, through this hymn, you and I, we're the speaker in the hymn. This is our voice, kind of, you know, this is a personal um, story in which we find ourselves. Alas is an expression of unhappiness, of pity, or concern. And I think 
kind of a sense of that. You know, we say, alas, we see Jesus on the cross and we say, alas, because we are, we are astounded. We are bewildered by the actions that Jesus took on our behalf. And so we ask these questions there as the hymn starts. We're still kind of shocked. And of course, we know the answers are, are yes to these questions. Did my Savior bleed? Did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? And here's where we start to kind of crawl down into the muck and feel bad, right? We're calling ourselves worms. You know, we call ourselves poor, miserable sinners, wretched sinner. That's kind of, you know, it's part of our liturgy and our confession of sins. You know, maybe it would make sense as we reflect upon this, maybe it would make sense for Jesus to die for someone who who really deserved that, right? Someone who was worthy, who was righteous, who was good. We'd say, oh, well, that would maybe make sense that Jesus would be willing to do that for those kind of people. That's not us, though, right? We really didn't deserve what Jesus did, how he bled, and how he died how he devoted that sacred, innocent head to that crown of thorns. We say, alas, because we look on at his suffering and we recognize that we are responsible. Now, verse 2 begins with another question. And I have to admit, all I, all I could think about as I read this first question was about an an annoying yet beloved TV character from the 90s. Did anyone watch the show Family Matters? Some of us. Steve Urkel? His catchphrase, you know, he would do something, you know, make a huge mess of something, whether from his, uh, his social awkwardness or maybe his physical awkwardness, and then he would be standing there looking at the aftermath, and he would say, Did I do that? You know, of course, Steve, yes, of course you did that. And yes, of course, we did that. We committed the crimes that have left Jesus to groan in pain upon the tree. He's taken the fall for you and for me. Even though he didn't do any of it, not responsible for any of it, he willingly became responsible for our sins and took them upon himself. And so this brings us to marvel at what Jesus is doing. It brings us to marvel at his attitude toward us. He is the one dying an excruciating death on the cross, and yet he is making sure that we receive the favor that we do not in any way deserve. That's grace. He is showing amazing pity for you and for me. He is showing an unbelievable love beyond degree, love that, that we've never seen before, love that we've never, we've never heard of anything like this before. This is supernatural. This is otherworldly, this expression of love and his grace and his pity that our Lord Jesus is, is showing as he is dying on the cross. Now, we've already gotten into our penitential posture here as we've walked through this hymn. We've already ducked into a dark place as we see our sin. And now here in verse 3, even creation itself has gone into a dark place. Creation itself is grieving the death of its creator. The death of God is such a horribly impactful and shocking event that creation cannot look on. The sun hides its face in grief, and unnatural darkness rolls in and covers the scene like a huge blanket. And then the earth, not to be outdone, the earth quakes in, an, in its own kind of mourning. So part of creation is mourning, yet the human creatures, they keep right on with their business of executing God's Son. And even though you and I 
You know, we, we weren't there, right? This was 2,000 years ago. We weren't there personally, you know, hammering the nails into Jesus' hands. We weren't personally there jeering him while he was hanging on the tree. But we might as well have been there. Because we know that we were intimately involved in killing Jesus. And if the sun up there in the sky can't look on, then how, how am I supposed to do that? How can I look on at this scene as my face begins to blush now at what I'm seeing? I, I, I start to feel the desperate urge to just hide. I'm blushing because I know full well that I'm responsible. And that's my fault. And I don't know about you, but I know personally for me, when I have done something wrong, when, I have, when, when my actions or, or even my inactions have led to someone suffering pain or great sadness, my face, when I realize that it was my fault, my face turns a deep crimson color. And I am looking for the nearest hole to crawl in and just get away and hide from everything. And so, when we look at the cross, shouldn't we kind of be blushing? Shouldn't we have an urge, a desperate urge to, to kind of hide our face? Because in a sense, you know, the cross should still be kind of hard for us to look at. We should see the blood stains, the sweat, and the tears that Jesus shed. We should hear the echoes of his groaning and his sighing and his dying reverberating out from the rugged wood of the cross. It's a very complex set of emotions as we look, as we reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're overwhelmed as our heart dissolves in thankfulness, but at the same time, our eyes melt into a river of liquid sorrow, tears over our sin streaming down our faces. But crying and wallowing in our grief, even if we did that for a thousand years, wouldn't do any good, right? Never would make up for what we've done. All the most sincere expressions of our grief will never get us close to repaying the debt that Jesus paid for us. Nor should we try to, right? We can't repay him. He's not asking us to try to repay him. So what then shall we do? We want to do something, right? What should we do? And the hymn ends. Here, Lord, take my life. You bled for it. You died for it. I belong to you now. I'm not my own. I am yours. And so take me and lead me and use me. Use me to love others. Use me to, to make my payments, you know, not, not to you, God, but use me to make my, my payments of love to those around me who need that love. What we have to offer is, is not much. Remember, we're, we're worms, right? We're poor, miserable sinners. But through his bleeding and through his dying, he gives us worth. He makes us valuable. He gives us a purpose. He has given us a hope, a real living hope for the future. Now, even though we've kind of been in that dark place here tonight, we can still look at the cross from those other angles too, right? Knowing what Jesus has done for us. We can still look at it and we can see the victory there. We can see the love that Jesus has. We can see the peace that passes all understanding. But we can also look at it, sometimes it's good for us, right? To look at it and reflect upon the bloody suffering and death of our Savior. That bloody suffering and death that Jesus went through so that we can rejoice in the bloody suffering and death that has made us God's forgiven children. Yes, we are poor, miserable sinners, but more than that, we are his 
worth suffering and dying for saints. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all of our 